This is the newest version of my um, work on science, and uh, it's 2023. The person on the attractive picture is my granddaughter, Lily Ko, who contributed significantly to the work. The issue at hand is the relationship between science, commerce, and society in the case of medicine. Since the beginning, society, society has been plagued by disease. And equally since the beginning, society has thrown up about itself uh, people to help. Now, disease as an idea can be pretty complicated. I tend to define it as in the little note at the bottom, a displacement from the normal or normative human trajectory. In other words, all of us follow a certain path from childhood to the end of life, and disease kind of moves one off that track and represents a disturbance. The people charged with benefiting us uh, are currently called doctors. It's a profession of medicine. Before that, it involves priests and priestesses, shamans, witch doctors, and so forth. Uh, what is desired is above all prevention. Diagnosis, which means to separate one disease from another to achieve clarity, and most importantly, to effect a cure, to palliate, in other words, to improve things, or to offer a look into the future, prognosis. Of course, every society has, since the beginning, had the means of producing goods and services and commerce to engage in the trade. <coughs> As for science, which is a lead issue, um, science concerns nature. Um, pretty much what is there, what is out there in the real world, and how it got that way. Why the red color? Because the how it got that way is almost always imagined, and then the imagination's tested. Whereas what is there is generally facts about the world that can be recorded and have a greater level of confidence. Well, here is science, so to speak, um, and here is uh, the profession that deals with what the society really wants. And the way they get connected, at least in part, is through education, the channels of education. These are complicated for medicine. Uh, there are journals and review articles, books and chapters, editorials, uh, guidelines, a wide range of conduits, link science um, as it emerges uh, to the, the people who are actuating uh, medical care, which are doctors, essentially. In a separate link altogether, um, science connects to the means of production, and it does it through invention. I use the blue color for things of the mind, like inventing things, logic, and other concepts. Now, now what is it that one produces to help physicians prevent, diagnose, cure, palliate, and look into the future? Essentially, it's tests and treatments. That seems like a very small range of, of outcomes from something as vast as science, but one has to look at tests and treatments in a broad way. It isn't simply um, a lab test number. We, you don't, don't have that vision. It could be a machine the size of a building that you put people in. It could be a very elaborate um, artificial intelligence that takes information from a patient and tries to separate out what's wrong, so could diagnose and separate out one disease from another. So it, it's a broad range, and treatments are anything from pills in a bottle to new instruments uh, to machines, whatever it is that would affect um, palliation cure. All right, that's kind of the basic structure here. Um, a little note at the top says something important. Modern science provides the instruments and the reagents for scientists. 
to conduct their own work. And so there are a number of links between science and society. However, the one of interest here is in the case of medicine, and so I want to stick to that. Um, everything beyond that kind of superficial level requires we look into the process of scientific research, and that's what I want to do right here. A scientific research is a search conducted in a scientific manner for new knowledge people need. Now in the case of medicine, when we say people need it, we mean it's knowledge that will benefit patients. And essentially, if you don't mind my introducing the idea of an axiom or significance, one can define, one must define who will benefit, how they will benefit, and how much in order to say that it's new knowledge people need for medical research. The new knowledge, I, choose, I use yellow for it to denote a difference from other kinds of knowledge. Uh, it isn't yet achieved, it's what's hoped for. The term of art for this kind of new knowledge that we search for is the objective of the scientific research. It is, of course, always a noun. We search for things. As I've already hinted, there are at least three kinds. Uh, I use white for facts about the world as it is. People call it empiricism. It's a huge branch of science, and it's ancient. It's always been with us. The causes of things, how nature has created the world as it is, um, in general, most thinkers uh, have decided that this arises from the imagination and then it, these imaginings are tested to see how valid they are. They use red for the, subject, the subjective world. And then, as I said already, we invent by reshaping what nature has and what nature does in such a way as to do what we want to do. And, and all of that should make a certain amount of sense. Now, when I say we search, uh, I mean professional scientists search. It is like medicine, a profession. People are trained, they're educated, they have degrees, um, and their special knowledge, the unique center of their knowledge, is the conduct of actions that could achieve scientific aims, or excuse me, objectives, these things. The name for the actions used to achieve the new knowledge are called aims, and they're called specific aims because they're specific to the new knowledge. When you put yellow and blue together, you get green, so I use green for the link between these, the merge of these two, the merge of the, of the um, dreamed about, hoped for new knowledge, and the aims that professional scientists know how to use. Now with this thing in place, this structure, um, the little box becomes usable and is very important. One can imaginably define an objective as scientifically valid to the extent that aims for its fulfillment, that's these things, are professionally sound. And that's probably the best way I've ever defined what it means to have scientifically valid objectives. With the aims are a mixture of techniques, that means skills, and methods, that means recipes. All right, that's kind of a, a, a worthwhile logical structure. Now, tools like to be used, and when new methods come along, new techniques come along, scientists like to use them uh, to get new knowledge that is, in a way, specific, if you like, to these new ways of taking action. And that's fine. That's one of the ways that science grows. But that's only medical research. When the tools are used for new knowledge that fulfills the criterion of need, and in the case of medicine, patients who would use it 
and benefit in this manner to this extent. That's not in any way to deny or diminish the importance of science for its own sake. It's simply to create a distinction with a real meaning. Now, this leads immediately to what I call the ladder of objectives. Many objectives in science are very far from a new test or a treatment, very far from something a physician can put to work for the betterment of a particular patient. However, in medical research, one expects the objective to be linked through a sequence of logical um, statements to other objectives, culminating in a new test or treatment that can be tried in patients or culminating in knowledge that will definitely aid physicians in their use of available tests and treatments to benefit patients. In other words, either arm the physician with new instruments, that's tests and treatments, or educate the physician in specific ways concerning human disease so as to improve their understanding of disease and their ability to work. Failing of that linkage, the research cannot properly be called medical research. Well enough. The end of all scientific research is publication, and the publication is a professional writing, uh, a so-called research paper. It's a kind of literary form. Uh, better than anyone else, Thomas Kuhn, uh, has helped us understand the interior structure of the research profession. An individual scientist in a profession has a modest number, perhaps 20 to 100 real colleagues worldwide with whom that person will share theories, research needs, the kind of things you should look for, methods and techniques, and paradigms, uh, very important accomplishments and ideas that kind of govern the way the field runs itself. Here's this picture. All right, now we have at this point a working structure that's really not bad at all for how science links to medicine, but we need to do a little more detail work to fill in um, enough uh, to make the discussion really fruitful. The blank screen is to give us a moment of peace. And now the empirical research in white. It is verifiable facts from the world as it is. That's the purpose of such research. Now, the facts in the case of science in general and in the case of medicine are always measurements. To make them verifiable. They have to be conducted in a scientific manner. That means the aims, that's your techniques and methods, have to be workable in the opinion of the profession of scientific research at the time they're employed. And they have to be applied to a uh, definable sample of the objective world as it is. These are three big phrases. First of all, a sample. Second, what do we mean by objective? Third, as it is. Let's do objective first. Objective means the world of the senses, even senses aided by machines, as contrasted with the subjective world of the imagination, the world of dreams. Now let's consider what we mean by sample. We want to know the number of bluebirds in the backyard. This requires that we make a sample of backyards in the real world. But that would require we define exactly what we mean by a backyard. And then we create a sample of backyards thus defined. And we have to decide 
what we want that sample to represent. Is it the city of Chicago? That's where I'm writing from. Is it uh, North America? Is it um, the Eurasian continent? Is it the whole planet? What are we doing in terms of the extensiveness of the sample? How do we define a bluebird? And then how do we do our counts of bluebirds from the objective world as it is? When we go into backyards to count bluebirds, how do we know they don't fly away? When you're counting bluebirds, how do you keep from counting the same bluebird twice? If you can account for all these factors, someone else can verify what you did. And if a fact isn't verifiable, it isn't scientific. If it's verifiable in principle, it's scientific. If it's been verified at least once, it's probably true. If it's been verified repeatedly, it's taken as true. If it's tested correctly and not verified, then one needs additional measurements by others to resolve if it's true or not. What do we do with verified facts? Well, they're the ground of imagination about how facts got to be the way they are. You can't imagine how things got to be the way they are if you don't know how they are. And they are the, the material that we reshape to make our inventions. They're the world that we have around us. So they're in the red and the blue areas. Uh, facts can be used to make estimates of cause. And the first of these empirical axioms is in every murder mystery. Um, if A is not before B, A doesn't accompany B, then A doesn't cause B. Uh, she was not the last person to see him alive, and she has an alibi that places her in a different city when he was killed. Not a good suspect. This other person was the last person to see him alive, and we don't know where that person was. A very good suspect. And then facts over time can disclose a uh, cause. This occurred, then that occurred, then that occurred. If you look closely, this is essentially a derivative of that. The problem of causal modeling using statistical association testing is not within the scope of this present uh, presentation. Now, the very nature of making measurements about things in the real world gets you into the problem of naming things. You measure facts about things, but what are things? Things are essentially mathematical sets whose elements are the facts ascertained concerning that, that thing. There'll be a certain fuzziness to the edge in that some elements will be shared by multiple things thus defined. I can't carry the argument further within this particular video but it's apparent that the very nature of facts implies the constellation of facts as in the elements of a set to define things. When we've done with our new facts, we publish them. They enter the great pool of human knowledge which scholars use to stimulate imagination or invention or to be sure that what they're out to get for the first time isn't already there, or as what they are going to go out to attempt to verify or falsify, as the case may be. Now, because we're dealing with the case of medicine, we have to look at disease. And in fact, as you could guess already, every disease is a named empirical, theoretical, inventional thing because every disease is essentially a set whose elements are empirical uh, facts, 
theoretical notions and inventional contrivances that cluster about it. Well, here I've drawn a picture of uh, a disease. It has in white its empirical facts, the subjective illness as reported by the patient, physical findings in the body, measurements in the blood, organs, tissue, cells, DNA, RNA, proteome, metabolome, and every ohm now and in the distant future, all constellated around that name of that thing. Certain of the empirical facts may be highlighted as starting places, so-called etiologies. COVID, a locomotive ran him over. Genes patently abnormal on both chromosomes, surely the cause of the mischief that I can find in the person. Alcohol abuse documented with a liver that is damaged beyond repair from alcohol, straightforward. Marked obesity with an unfortunate genetic predisposition leading to adult onset diabetes. That's in red. That's a construct. It's a name that one could attach to a disease. And in that disease, we have a number of manifestations and we have this red stuff, which is theory of causes. Let me look at a few of them. They're put in this red box for a reason. Insulin resistance. Well, now, insulin resistance is empirical. It is disproportionately high insulin for the glucose, usually accompanied by an abnormally high glucose. These are things that could go in the white box. I put them in red because they're ascribed to a resistance of body cells to the signaling action of insulin such that they do not take up in glucose correctly. That is not demonstrated in a person. It is sought to underlie what can be demonstrated. Can one find cells that do not signal correctly with insulin? Of course. Can one do that with human cells from a normal patient with diabetes? It is not done. Protein glycation above normal. Well, that's well known to be empirical fact, and it is demonstrated by hemoglobin A1c. The red cell lives 90 days, so it's a 90-day average. That's a theory that is, in fact, an empirical fact. High urine albumin appears. Well, that's thought to be a leakage of albumin from the blood into the urine through the glomerular filtering apparatus of the kidney. And some have ascribed that to glycation of the filtering membranes. Well, that latter is pure theory. The finding of the high albumin is pure objectivity, pure empiricism. The systolic blood pressure, the higher of the two numbers, is high. That's often ascribed to the fact that there's kidney disease. But that's theory. And there are multiple conflicting theories. The wall of the left ventricle is thickened, left ventricular hypertrophy, often ascribed to an increased pressure volume integral from the high pressure. But there may be other causes, hormonal disturbances, for example. Again, manifestations that are empirical, the causes of which are uncertain. Now, associated with the disease are its tests and treatments, which involve causes, aspects of the theory of intervening causes, so-called pathogenesis, and of course, manifestations themselves. These tests and treatments have arisen from scientific understanding, and ultimately, science reaches the point where the test or treatment is tried in humans. The purpose of the tests and treatments are, in the case of tests, to detect and quantify all of these manifestations and to diagnose, separate a particular disease from another disease from all of the various measurements that can be made. 
The treatments are to prevent, cure, palliate, and taken together with testing, provide some glimpse into the future. All of them have been tried and have passed through the trial to success. Now, I want to call attention to the lower border of these rectangles. The science that has given rise to the invention of the new tests and treatments culminates in trial as the terminal objective, the final objective. At this point, the material product is ready to test and therefore available, and the scientific inquiry has essentially come to a concluding point. The trial is conducted according to rules that belong to the specialty of trialism, and properly done is done according to those rules in a specialized way to see if the tests indeed detect and quantify and separate diseases as desired, and if the treatments prevent, cure, and palliate, and provide insights into the future. If they do not, that is unfortunate, and they're rejected. If they do, then the science has achieved a unique public good. Unique because it wasn't there before, it's new. Public good because these are passed on to the public as a benefit for what it is they want from medicine. Now what do we do when we've achieved the unique public good? We publish it. And that gives, for, for at least for the authors, honor. And honor is very nice. It's a, it's a, it's a reward. In addition, um, the educational apparatus picks up the original publication and transfers it into the medical profession. The main information is how it works and what it adds. What it adds above what was there already. Now at this point, I want to add above and beyond these tests and treatments that many, many, many publications do not concern trials. They concern science concerning empirical causes, the pathogenesis, the theory of cause, the finding of new manifestations. And these two are channeled through the educational structure into the education of physicians. It does not give them new instruments with which to combat and benefit disease and benefit patients, but it gives them new knowledge to give them a greater understanding which will presumably improve the way in which they conduct their work. Whereas these things can often be shown to benefit people directly, a greater understanding has rarely been tested as a manner of improving patient care. These two forms of, of knowledge, practical wisdom and theoretical uh, wisdom, are distinct, are they not? They are completely homologous to the benefits of a liberal education and a technical education. I leave it there. In order to make the public good public, it must be produced. And the reward for producing it is money. And this is where commerce and industry join uh, science in the case of medicine precisely where the tip of this arrow touches the double border around this box, there and nowhere else. Now, I'd like to expand upon what I've provided in an example that is of massive importance and contains uh, delightful and beautiful scientific elements. My guide here, um, in addition to Thomas Kuhn, is this person, Karl Popper. These are his dates. This is, for me, his greatest book. 
the first 50 pages or so readable by anybody. Epistemology, the theory of knowledge, the nature of knowledge, is defined down at the lower right. His forebears, Bacon, Hume, Kant, Wittgenstein, Russell, Kripke, these are all people who have made enormous contributions to the theory of knowledge, and they are not the only ones. I simply list them in, because, in my opinion, they seem to be in his lineage or the other way around. The problem was that after the Second World War, America was beset upon by cardiovascular disease, and government recognized a societal objective was the betterment of cardiovascular disease, its reduction. The National Heart Institute was formed around that time, probably in part to reduce cardiovascular disease. I'm not a historian of medicine, so I say probably. Money was made available to achieve this goal, and because it is not an objective that is immediately susceptible of scientific research, scientists immediately transformed it to treatment to reduce cardiovascular disease. Now you might say, that seems very premature. How would the scientists in the 40s have done that? And the answer is, they already had a rather complete theory of cardiovascular disease. And the th disease construct had as its major highlights this. Age stiffens and narrows blood vessels. And that would raise the systolic blood pressure. Physicists of considerable note confirmed that stiffening the otherwise elastic walls of vessels, when combined with the fact that the heart, with every beat, pulses the blood into the vessels with a pressure pulse, would lead to a spiking or narrowing an increase of the peak value and in fact a fall of the value between beats, the so-called diastolic pressure. The narrowing would reduce flow to the brain, the heart, and the kidneys and lead to stroke, heart attack, and kidney failure. And empirically, studies of the bodies of aged people showed narrow and stiffened vessels. It was a very satisfying idea. Because the diastolic pressure falls with age, and because blood was surely flowing, the high systolic pressure was thought to be the means by which blood was kept flowing. Now, on the other hand, it was well observed that some younger people, 20s, 30s, even 40s, would develop diastolic blood pressure elevation. And in the extreme of this, one could observe vessel damage over very short periods of time by looking at the vessels in the eyes and by observing the rapid onset of stroke, heart attack, and kidney failure. And in certain people, this would be like a storm, the high diastolic pressure followed by rapid damaging disease. This was true. And it gave rise to what Karl Popper has called all statement. The all statement is that diastolic pressure above a certain normative point causes cardiovascular disease all the time. It's how nature works. It's imagined, but it's perfectly reasonable. By the logic of the modus tollens, a medieval form of logic, so the mode of denial, if that were true, then lowering the diastolic pressure when high below that normative value must, I use the red here to link it back, must reduce cardiovascular disease. In other words, the all statement has been transformed into a singular statement, a singular statement that is reducible to measurement in the empirical domain. So essentially, Popper's insight 
is that all statements which are imaginative can be converted into measurement in the empirical domain through the modus tollens. Another of his insights I cannot explore here is that no number of singular statements will of themselves create an all statement. That requires the imaginative mind. All right, we need to leave the philosophical realm and say, well, what happened? It led to an interim objective not quite what the public wants, but this trial. Measure cardiovascular disease within and without drugs to lower diastolic pressure. They had drugs, albeit crude, but they used them. The trial was done. The trial was successful. It opened the door to objective two. Get better drugs to lower diastolic pressure and use them more and more widely. So this is an example of success using the logical structures that I've provided. But it was known from the very beginning that it would be a failure because most cardiovascular disease occurs later in life in people who do not have elevated diastolic blood pressures. In fact, specifically have low diastolic pressures. Therefore, at the same time, the Heart Institute maintained the desire to fulfill the same objective. And one person came forward, it would appear one person came forward with an altogether different notion, brilliant as it turns out, inspired as it turns out, and rather radical. The person said, as an interim objective, let's not conduct treatment. Let us conduct empirical research to identify hitherto unknown new factors in normal people who go on to cardiovascular disease. In other words, use the, ax the empirical axiom of cause. Things in normal people who later get cardiovascular disease are presumably causal by the axiom of cause. This is a startling idea. It is also exhausting because you're now talking about obser observing normal people long enough to find them getting cardiovascular disease and you'll need numbers and over time it impressed enough people that it was undertaken. The finding of the empirical research was counter uh, to everything people knew. A higher systolic blood pressure in your normal years accompanied higher cardiovascular rates as you converted from normal to cardiovascular disease a higher systolic pressure preceded that conversion, meaning it was there before cardiovascular disease could be detected. And vessel stiffness, the very make and mark of the theory prevalent at the time, was not predictive of cardiovascular disease. This led to a radically new all statement. Systolic pressure above a certain point causes cardiovascular disease and by the modus tollens lowering the pressure below that point must reduce in this case strokes as a countable and frequent kind of cardiovascular disease that became an interim objective which was to count strokes with or without drugs to lower systolic pressure a trial now as I've told you, the whole world believed, and for good reason, it was a systolic blood pressure that kept the blood flowing in older people. The idea of lowering it seemed not only dangerous, but foolhardy, and perhaps partaking of the criminally foolhardy. Nevertheless, the trial was done. The answer was yes. It led 
to invention to get more drugs to lower systolic pressure, and it altered health care planet-wide for older people forever. Now, this is such an important example of science intervening in medicine. It's worth a serious look, and I propose to take that look. But before going on to take my look, I want to come back to the naming of objectives. I'm going to concern myself only with the second helping, the one about going beyond diastolic blood pressure. The objective was the causes of cardiovascular disease. It's in red. The person who came up with this imagined that there were causes of cardiovascular disease to be found in normal people. That's the underlying dream here. It's a scientific final objective. The interim objective is to identify the factors in normal people. That's using the axiom of cause, it's an interim objective. The trial is actually very complicated. It's a societal objective in that if it were true, it would immediately, through education, change medical practice. It's interim because it needs to go on to get drugs. And, and at the time, there were few indeed to lower systolic pressure. And getting the drugs is a, both a societal and a scientific final objective. Uh, in passing, I want to point out the NIH, even today, has what are called requests for applications. Those are objectives the NIH would like scientists to consider and which they place at a higher priority than usual because they are societally driven, as opposed to program announcements, which are objectives chosen by excellent panels of scientists. All right, here is the place where the work was done. A town west of Boston, Framingham, Massachusetts. The picture is from the 30s, I suspect. And I show this only to comment that the people of the town embraced the idea of observation of normal people to see if it was possible to detect the underlying causes of cardiovascular disease. And to that enterprise, they willingly lent themselves over decades of time for no reimbursement, only for the betterment of the human condition. It is among the purest examples of altruism that one can imagine. And they did this, and it is because they did it that the work could be done. The person is Thomas Dauber, recognized by everyone as the author of the work, the person who came up with the amazing, brilliant, shocking idea that the normals harbored the cause of cardiovascular disease within themselves. These were his years, this was his training and edu medical education, this is where he did his training and he rose to be chief of medicine. He was given the leadership of the Framingham study by the National Heart Institute in 1949, was replaced by someone else in 1966, and went on to a very fine career uh, in, as chair of preventative medicine at Boston University. His uh, New York Times obit uh, tells us he died uh, in Naples, Florida. He was a lifetime sailor, and that's a very good place. He lived a long life. The obit makes mention of the design, uh, watching people develop heart disease uh, and looking back in their records. Professor Cannell, who succeeded Dauber as the head of the, institute, of the program in 1966, specifically uh, credited him as the chief architect of the study. That's major praise. Um, 
1961, the um, writer points out that the initial work came out um, and the study was still going on when Dauber finished his life. All well and good. Now, I'd like to turn to the earliest example I can find of Dauber's own words, 9350. I am not a historian of medicine. I imagine someone who is will be able to find earlier statements by Dauber about the logic of the Framingham study. But since I am limited by who I am, this will have to do. He begins his talk by talking about epidemiology, which is what he was going to do, the study of disease in the populations where it exists. In this footnote, he quotes another man named Wade Hampton Frost, who was chair of epidemiology at Johns Hopkins. Frost, he said, said this, that epidemiology, a purely empirical business, includes the orderly arrangement of facts into chains of inference, which extend more or less beyond the bounds of direct observation. Well, what is Frost talking about here? He's talking about the empirical axiom of cause. And Dauber, in its very straightforward way, took the hint. As a working hypothesis, he says, it is assumed that these diseases, that's cardiovascular diseases, do not each have a single cause, but that they are the result of, now watch this, multiple causes which work slowly within the individual. Eight words. That's his hypothesis. That's the dream. That's the part in red. That's the imaginative impulse that gave rise to the entire Framingham study. Eight words. Well, once you have the eight words, the rest is very straightforward. We're going to study populations of normal composition, including both the sick and the well, as they are found in the community. And what are we going to actually um, do? They will define some people as free of cardiovascular disease. They will be a group containing the name normals and observed over a period of years till they divide into two groups. One named new onset cardiovascular disease, the other named no new cardiovascular disease, and they will search for the factors which were present in the one and not the other. Obviously the one who went on to cardiovascular disease. What are factors? Facts that are actors, actors, Factors, facts, actors. I have um, put into this colorful notation what he just said, to say it again. The societal objective causes of cardiovascular disease. That's the way the scientists correctly translate what the society is really saying, which get rid of this disease. And he's saying, I'm going to use the empirical axiom of cause. And this is the logic. I don't need to read it. You're looking at it on the screen. You can see how it works. This is the all statement. This is the modus tollens. And this is the experiment. What's the objective factors in those who do versus who do not subsequently display cardiovascular disease? What are the aims? Define the normals. Watch them. When they've divided themselves into the two groups, find the factors that are associated with cardiovascular disease onset. The blue and the yellow go together with perfect logicality to create the green hypothesis. All I've done here is put Dauber's own words at the margin. I only pause here for a moment to point out at specific aims invariably are the logical requirements of the objective abstracted from the reality of their enactment. 
I've recopied the Dauber aims and underlined words that clearly require massive expansion in terms of detail. And it is the research plan that specifies the task sequence budget methods and techniques that will realize all of the details that are necessary to make the aims actually happen in the real world. I began typing this messy looking stuff just to give you an idea how you'd begin making a research plan. No doubt the Framingham had notebooks filled with methods and techniques um, because of the size and complexity. Well, I'm, I'm, Framingham has many publications, but this was the central one. 1980, it opened in 49, let's say 50, that's 31 years. Dauber is not the first author. Professor Connell, who is now the head of the program, put himself there, but he kept Dauber there even though Dauber actually by this time had retired as head of um, medicine, uh, head of um, uh, epidemiology at uh, Boston University. So it shows you what powerful respect he had for him. Um, here's what they found. Isolated systolic pressure, pressure high, not high, seems to be the factor that satisfied Dauber's original idea. I make notes down here about the world that focused on the deadliness of the diastolic and the normal, uh, the hypothesis of normal aging. What did they find? Well, here's their data. They found the isolated increase in systolic pressure begins in the 50s and rises steeply thereafter, which is exactly when cardiovascular disease goes up. This would have surprised nobody. This was not novel. The two-year incidence rate of new cardiovascular disease among people 55 to 74 with isolated systolic hypertension, rate per thousand, 113 in men, 50 in women. Fine. The ratio of this rate to the rate observed in people without isolated systolic pressure, 3.5 to 3.8, that's a huge relative risk ratio. It's enormous. It's of the order of what you find in major carcinogens, smoking for cardiovascular disease that high, this wouldn't have done it. Because the argument would be, hey, the narrower the vessels, the rigider the vessels, the more cardiovascular disease, the higher the systolic pressure. Nothing's happened. Here, in a single um, logistic regression, cardiovascular disease onset is correlated with systolic pressure and vessel stiffness as determined by pulse wave measurements is not correlated at all. It's this. This handful of numbers here is the result of 30 years of work and it's transformative. It's telling you the old idea was wrong and systolic pressure is dangerous. Before I leave, what's this? Well, this was a silly idea. The higher the systolic pressure, the more it varies, liability, damage vessels, and cause strokes. Well, that was nonsense. And it's not worth more than 20 seconds of comment. What did they conclude? We need a trial. A we need a controlled trial of treating the systolic pressure. Wow, what a dangerous, crazy-making idea. And the trial was undertaken. It looked like this. Gather a large number of elderly people with isolated systolic hypertension and no cardiovascular disease. Put half of them in a placebo group. Half of them got a diuretic. If it didn't lower the pressure enough, double it. If that didn't work, add a blocker of the beta-adrenergic nervous system. If that didn't work, add more. 
until you got the pressure down by 20 millimeters roughly. The end result, I believe they got a 12 millimeter fall. The final result was published here in 1991. 1991, that's 41 years from the promulgation, uh, 42 years if you believe 49, uh, of the brilliant idea and its consummation. Dr. Henry Black was a principal investigator of one of the 17 study centers that did this work. He and I had a visit, 7-10-2012, where he told me directly that a majority of the study center directors did not want to do the trial. They thought they would have enormous uh, outbreak of strokes and that it would be um, dangerous and that they might be criticized and it might be bad for their reputation. Ultimately, they were um, encouraged to do it and they did it. And this was the result. This is stroke per 100 people accumulated over five years of the trial. This is the untreated, that's the treated. And that was that. P-value very low. Now I'd like to look at this wonderful story through the lens of Thomas Kuhn's ideas. Kuhn would have said, well, in the core elite of people who studied cardiovascular disease and blood pressure, the ruling paradigm was only diastolic pressure causes cardiovascular disease, and it was true in young people. Normal science, which articulates and expands on a ruling paradigm, did just that. And Framingham was an example. It essentially took off from here um, and looked to see if there were a wider range of possible factors and discovered systolic pressure after 30 years of work. Did that destroy the ruling paradigm? No, it did not. However, it affected the ruling paradigm such that normal science then could include what you might call an extraordinary science, which aims at falsifying crucial predictions of the ruling paradigm and replacing it. That was a Shep trial. It was done. It destroyed the ruling paradigm. It caused a scientific revolution and changed the paradigm forever. It changed medical treatment forever. And the treatment of systolic hypertension would now be, more or less, among the most common activities conducted in general health care in the world. This very attractive graph comes from this paper. It shows the trials before the Shep study. They principally focused on people with elevated diastolic pressure. After Shep, systolic pressure was a principal focus of attention. Well, I finished my work. I've illustrated um, the way in which science uh, relates to the needs of society in the case of medicine through uh, its own systems and through the means of production. Of course, in this case, physicians began to treat systolic blood pressure with whatever drugs they had available. And this occurred through the means of education. Uh, industry took on the development of more and more blood pressure agents, the calcium channel blockers, the ACEs and the ARBs, no doubt billions and billions and billions of new dollars passed through industry because of this work. I'm not a student of industrial um, um, finances in relation to drugs and tests, so I'm simply guessing that's true. And in presenting this, I've more or less concluded what I have to say on the topic. And it is here I leave you and end my presentation. Thank you for coming. Take care. Bye-bye.